Previously on Quest Friends. I don't know if I ever really mentioned much, but I grew up in a place called the Wheel of Baz. It's kind of like a, a sanctuary for machines. And I spent my whole life there. The same people, the same places. Nothing really changed until, until I decided to start traveling. Little friend, wherever you take that robe and that walking stick, just know that all the wheel, yes, even J.K.O., is there with you. And when you do come back, they'll be your keys home. You know one thing, I know the other. Words aren't going to solve this shot. I have to show you. And by the time you finally look up at the Apocrita itself, you can see its shadow covering all of the Wheel of Bods. And that's when you wake up. One day, there was a baby dragon lying in a bed of flowers. The dragon's name was Anuki, but the flowers, they never did say. Maybe the flowers didn't speak in psychic links, or maybe they couldn't think of what to tell her, or maybe they were simply shy. But Anuki didn't mind. She always had so much to share. Stories of adventures, and of flying, and of her best friend in the whole wide world who saved her from that nasty TJ and did everything he could to keep her safe. And Anuki felt safe. She had felt safe for a long time. But the flowers? Well, with a rump bump bump, the baby dragon pounced on her prey. And with a munch, 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 she gobbled up all the flowers resting in the bed. But for the first time, Inuki didn't eat every single flower. She didn't even eat half because her belly was full and the flowers were so pretty. Inuki knew it would be selfish not to share them with all her friends because Inuki had friends. She had so many friends and she had so many flowers and she was so, so, so very happy. Okay, so something that I like to do is keep track of what the timeline for Quest Friends looks like. It just tickles me to think of things of how, like, the first, I don't know, four chapters took place over two weeks. So I've been thinking about the last chapter, One Neon Night. Now hear me out with the timeline here. (laughs) The episode starts in, I think, about daytime, because I think I do reference the sun, at which point you get captured by the Speedy Speed Boys. You get taken to their hideout, and then eh, I describe it as a few hours long. And then after that, Jimmy Wynn says, hey, when morning hits, we're going to race. So presumably you have gone from afternoon, a full day, all the way through the evening, all the way continuing to the morning, and then afterwards. Shockingly, one neon night took about one night long. I say this to explain the fact that you have probably been up for 24 hours at this point. And that's fine for Ness, that's fine for Misha, that's fine for Kubo. Ellie might claim that's fine for her, I'm not sure. It's not fine. (laughs) But it's not, everyone needs to sleep. So, I, I, you know, I try not to make executive decisions, but I've kind of made a decision. You probably all went to sleep pretty soon after the last episode with everybody. So, uh, for example, Ellie, what what does Ellie dream about? Ellie dreams about... (laughs) patreon short story that i'm writing right now that is literally after one neon night ellie having a very specific dream oh right it is a dream this isn't just a promo you your short story that is being written for february is a dream it's that dream well uh break out the commercial music again you too can find out what ellie was dreaming about right here at this moment by going to patreon slash questfriends.com i don't remember the link anymore patreon.com slash quest friends subscribe at a five dollar level it above not only do you get a short story every month you get behind the scenes clips gm notes and an npc shout outs so i guess we're not talking about that this episode 
So let's move on to Hop, <laughs> I guess. Hop, I'm only going to direct your dream a little bit in that I am saying you are dreaming of a flex skill. So what are you dreaming about and how does this give Hop his flex skill for the upcoming day? Only direct a little bit. What a cruel, irrational <laughs> world we live in. What a, what a mean... <laughs> So, like... One last bullying Hallie for the road. Hopper's dream is, like, one of those heroic dreams where he's doing, like, an Old West thing, and in this one, he's driving a wagon real fast down the Old Town Road, away from some nefarious villains. He's got, like, what they're after. He's got the MacGuffin, and he's going. (laughs) And he knows that he probably can't get away from them, so what he does is he, real smooth-like, in one fell swoop, somehow with horses, parallel parks the wagon in, like, a side alley, and then the bad guys ride on past, none the wild that he's hiding there because his flex skill this season is this season this chapter is parallel parking thanks twitter because you you oh, i should explain i ran a full I, <laughs> there were four options for his flex skill there was uh parallel parking couponing slash bargain hunting coffee making and rolling above a six and if they gotten enough votes i would have petitioned to kyle make that a flex skill it would never have worked but Twitter voted for parallel parking. So that is Hopper's skill. So as I understand, Emily's dream, or Ellie's dream, was a plug to Patreon, and this one is a plug to Twitter. <laughs> yeah, but Hallie's Twitter specifically. <laughs> no. Not even the class friend's Twitter. <laughs> my Twitter. Just Hallie. Go to my Twitter. Oh, no. To see this poll that's already done that you can't vote in anymore. What's your Twitter, Hallie? Where can they go? You can find me at Hallie Coots. That's my name. That's my handle. H-A-L-L-I-E-K-O-O-N-T-Z. Like the author, no relation. That's that's my that's my Twitter. Okay, so Misha. <laughs> you presumably aren't sleeping, because no. Misha never sleeps. So what is Misha doing during this period of time? Misha is just doing the equivalent of like frolicking down a meadow or whatever they are very happy and feeling very liberated and so they are just running and enjoying night and they are like for once not being super anxious about it being night so where this leads to my other question where is everyone sleeping because i can think of like three possibilities there's like the room where you got red's blessing which had a ghost there's (laughs) your bunks in coachman's tree there's in the ladybug and neither of those are conducive to frolicking. See, my vision is the classic Pokemon setup where we are like without tents, like on bedrolls around like a campfire under the stars next to where we parked the ladybug. Were you planning to like go somewhere or are you just sleeping outside even though the Speedy Speed Boys gave you a room to sleep in? I think we like camping. Yeah. <laughs> I think we just genuinely really like... We needed some air. (laughs) Like We like the privacy of having like our own space away from others. Okay, so it's like camping in your backyard. Ayn will come with little pizza bagels every so often that she cooked. Except that we said goodbye to everyone. Yeah. And Ness robbed everyone. (laughs) Oh, we probably... We probably left. That's all correct. (laughs) Ness robbed them. That's why we're not sleeping. (laughs) We are like a little ways away. All right, and then finally, let's go to Shock. And before we talk about what Shock is dreaming about, I'd like to quickly encourage anyone in the audience who hasn't listened to Shock's memory to do one of two things. One, if this is your first time listening to Quest Friends, hey, welcome. Sorry, it's just been a been a bit of like random confusion and stuff. This is not a great place to start because <laughs> there's a lot of assumed stuff that happened. So we check questfriendspodcast.com slash about for a summary of the first half of the show if you want to just jump in as far as you can or some recommended first episodes. If you are caught up and you somehow skipped Shock's Memory Part 1 and Part 2, now is your time to stop and go back and listen to them. I'm not joking. This isn't like, oh man, this is going to make the story make a slight bit more sense and like emotion. No, this will make the story make sense if you go back and listen to that. And then come back here and listen to Tom describe uh, Shock. Misha, while frolicking, turns around and sees Shock in his sleep. And what do they see in these last couple of moments of sleep? They see Shock 
not exactly thrashing about, but disturbed and making little noises, as if in like a weirdly vivid dream, and it's it gives me impression of a nightmare. Shock is not happy. And after almost crying out, Shock is just going to bolt upright. Shock! Shock, are you okay? I believe you are having a bad dream. I believe that is what is happening. Are you okay? We need to leave right now. Right now. We need to wake everyone up. And he's gonna hop out of the bedroll and start waking everyone else up. Misha will do that as well. If they can't wake people up, they will play the kazoo to make sure they wake up. (laughs) People always wake up to their kazoo. <laughs> it's like a military <laughs> horn. Ness is going to be very unhappy because he was having a dream where he was the Monopoly man <laughs> and he was having a great time having lots of money and spending it on things. So he'll he'll wake up swinging. Go, what, 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 what? Uh, is someone dead? Someone will be if we don't move fast. What, what? The wheel's under attack right now. My, my, my home. I, I haven't talked about it too much, but, um, Lowell knows exactly where it is now, and the Apocrita is attacking it, and we need to go. The wheel is approximately 327 kilometers from here. In the span of about three days, considering the swamp and the mountainous regions, we should be able to make it there. There's no time for that. But I do have another way, maybe. I think I can take us all there with my own powers. And Shock is going to activate his teleportation ability. And it's occurring to me, does my teleportation ability let us bring the ladybug to? I kind of don't want to abandon it, even though it theoretically does not in the text allow that. We've got stuff in there. I mean... I feel like we could leave it at the world's largest garage here. They would take good care of it. This was get rid of Cuba. Oh my god. Cuba can come with you. I thought thought Cuba was like in the ladybug now. Cuba is attached to the ladybug like a pair of dice that you put on the visor. You can take him off. (laughs) Okay. So... I'm going to say, unless you used XP, which I don't believe you have, you would not be souped up enough to take the ladybug with you. Okay. You could, though, bring Kubo. I, of course I could bring Kubo. But what if I use an XP, and since Misha is Shock's patron, buff Shock off enough that we take the ladybug with us. I have two XPs. Yeah, if you use 2 XP, 2 XP lets you stretch your powers beyond what they normally can be. So if you want to spend 2 XP because you are the patron, you can in fact move the ladybug. Is there any chance we will get more XPs before the finale is over? Because I don't know if this is how I want to spend my last 2 wow. XPs. I can promise that before the final minute of the final episode rolls, you will get at least one more XP. Will it be at the final minute, like, the end? By the way, you all get an XP that you cannot spend. I don't think Kyle would do that. I'm just not sure what we'll need the ladybug for. I mean, it can fly. I keep forgetting oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it has the beanie. That'd probably be helpful, I guess, because I can't fly. In that case, Misha will be sitting on the ladybug's driver's seat because they were doing that as soon as they thought that they would have to drive and then they will help Shock transport the ladybug as well. Okay. Shock, what does your teleportation look like? So Shock says, well, if we're doing, if we're going that big, it'll work a little bit differently this time. In this case, everybody step on to the ladybug and I'll, I'll just take the whole thing. And Shock is going to start, like, with his staff, scraping a circle into the dirt around the ladybug and, like, etching little lines and symbols going in from it all around it in true wizardly fashion. And while he works, if anyone's listening, he'll just say, well, I, um, I took a little bit of Argent with me when we first left Key, and I was trying to figure out how it worked. I'm not sure that I did it correctly, but I started to do some things, and now I can... Go to places I've already been. Huh. Hopper's very interested in this description of what Shock has done with Argent. Oh, 
I thought of another way in which Misha could help. If they focus on the descriptions that Shock has told them about the wheel, because I assume that he has talked to Misha a lot about it, they can also help focus Shock's powers. Ooh. That's really cute. I like that. Yeah, it is really cute. Oh, I like that. So yeah, it takes approximately 10 minutes to set up the spell. Once it's finished, Shock will like step on the back of the ladybug, like leaning up the back where the hole is. But we just covered with a tarp. We have a tarp. The nice tarp. Yeah, a really nice one. And he slams the staff down onto like the edge of the lines in the circle. And they will start to glow with a bluish light. And this hum starts to fill the air, getting louder and louder over those last couple minutes until everything goes white. And Shock is just picturing home that last day when he left the wheel and looked back over his shoulder. And as your vision goes white... Charged by your memories and Misha's kind of secondhand memories, other senses take its place. You can feel the weird chalky texture of the projector board. You hear the waves of the sea crashing against the pier. The white is replaced by a series of technicolor lights flashing angrily at you and little crustaceans linked to those lights. The hairs on the back of your hand perk up with the electricity buzzing from Power Stand Street. And you can smell just the metal and the rust and home. And as you are powered by these sensations, the blue light surrounding the ladybug starts getting replaced by these golden sparkles, which rise from the bottom of the ladybug all the way to the top, slowly erasing it from the Ba'aden forest as they go along. And then... Suddenly, crisp wind gently nips at your faces as you are transported from the warm swamps of the Ba'adenu forest to a much less cozy mountain cliffside, which I guess has enough space for the ladybug now. When I originally wrote the description, it was not ladybug sized. And I'm so glad that we made everything way harder for you by bringing the ladybug Ari, 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 how badly do you want another XP? A lot. No, <laughs> Please, no, no, you don't want it that badly. This is a devil's deal. No, you don't want it that no, badly. It's fine. It can't be as bad as everything that has happened to me already. In that case, Ari, who do you want to give your other GM intrusion point to? I am going to give it to Shock because I feel bad that I did all of this effort <laughs> and we might still lose the ladybug. Okay, so I'm going to retcon my retcon where I said the cliffside is now wide enough for a ladybug. It seems that way at first, but you start to hear this creaking and moaning of the vehicle as it starts tilting to its side to the left. And within a few seconds, unless you do something... It's going to fall down the mountainside. <laughs> well, um, okay. So I have three ideas, but two of them are tied to leveling up. That's a good point, because at this point, normally everyone would have leveled up. But in this case, we haven't. You haven't had time for a level up. However, Misha, you've had a pretty big empowering moment with the lady where you really came into your own. So if you're okay <laughs> with that kind of being the reason you leveled up... Okay. I'm happy to let you be tier 6 right now. Can I use my big thing that I chose? Because I think that might help. What's your big thing that you chose? I chose a thing called Move Mountains. <laughs> I can exert a tremendous amount of force. Within 250 feet of me, I can push up to 10 tons of material up to 50 feet. And so I can collapse buildings, redirect small rivers, etc. But I want to do it so that the, the mountain we're on is not, it's wide enough so that the ladybug doesn't topple over. <laughs> yes. So, the way this is set up is there is a mountain range, a mountain range, and a valley. We're about to make a plateau, I guess. <laughs> Well, <laughs> let's do this. Ari, describe <laughs> how you do this, how you harness well, the amazing powers of the data sphere. The way that I'm going to flavor it, it's a bit sad because Misha is still at the wheel and they are arriving to this place and the ladybug is falling and they don't want to be responsible for another car crashing. And so oh. in a sheer moment of desperation, they are going to do all in their power to not have the ladybug fall down. And so they are going to just focus on the earth below 
and just do this like hands up motion to raise it up and make a plateau while just both eyes glowing, one super purple. I'm going to quickly read this description <laughs> to make sure up 50 feet, this force can collapse building. Yeah, I guess we won't have all of the valley disappear because I'm a coward, I guess. <laughs> It'd just be too much for your power. But we will say that you pull a sliver of the valley, no more than a few inches thick, up towards the mountain. It looks like a reverse avalanche as the small sliver, which again is a lot of tons when you put it together, rises up from the valley and makes another layer on the mountainside. And it happens to come up just enough to push the ladybug's legs back up onto even ground. And especially compared to the lively swamps, it is shockingly quiet. No clouds in the sky, no plants other than grass and small clumps of flowers, no real sounds beyond the quiet whisper of the wind. That is, it's completely quiet for everyone but you, Shock. You can immediately recognize the communications from the wheel, the small little messages they send out for those who are tuned into their frequency. It's like a beeping. It doesn't really say anything. It's not like a Morse code where it has a specific message. It's just a beeping that you can hone in on. Nonverbal communication. Yeah. So you're now on even ground and Shock, you can still hear that beep, beep, beeping. So first things first, Shock is going to hop out and shout for everyone, come on, and run into what appears to be just a solid rock wall, just at full speed. <laughs> Misha will do so as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hopper assumes he's not seeing this right. I imagine he comes stumbling out the ladybug as hats askew, recovering from the recent almost fall. And he kind of like closes his eyes and shakes his head a little and goes, Shock, is there a door there? Yes. I don't. I don't see a door. Are you sure? I imagine at that moment we hit the rock wall, right? <laughs> oh, you're already through. Oh, yeah, as we, we pass right through. Fascinating. It seems that hidden within this non-machine focused area, there are in fact some sort of cloaking devices embedded into the wall itself. I'm learning all sorts of things. And Kubo just gently rolls, bonks against the wall, rolls back, rolls a foot to the left, and disappears into the mountain wall as well. Ness throws his little arms up, goes woohoo, and then rockets towards the wall where he saw Kubo go. Well, I'm gonna walk um, <laughs> slowly and check. It hops with Ellie. I'm gonna say you pat the wall a few times and then eventually your hand suddenly goes through. <laughs> <laughs> She's gonna, like, be putting her hand in and out <laughs> and then finally go through, but, like, cringing because it doesn't look like she should be able to go through even though she knows that she can. The same with you, Hop. Yeah, Hops will, like, put his hand through and then as soon as it eats up to his wrist, be like, okay. And then just the rest of his body goes through about as slowly. He's not as sure, but... Everybody else did it, and that seemed to work. So I was really tempted to, if he stuck his hand through, just to grab his hand and hold him. <laughs> and as you make your way in, the stumbling footsteps of Hop being pulled in, which is now what happened, <laughs> echo as if he had just stepped on metal, because that's what he did. Whereas just outside, it was just nature. Some flowers, some mountainsides. Now you seem to be in what looks to be a regular cave, but there is cheap rusted sheet metal bolted on all ends. And it extends for a few dozen feet, but at the end of this little short hallway, you can see Shock and Misha. And Shock at this end is where that beeping sound is coming from. And I'm going to say when you get close enough, it stops. It'll play the audio at specific distances to like machine brains. But if it recognizes a machine brain is close enough, it'll stop beeping because that's annoying as hell. And so as Shock approaches, he's going to say, OK, I can do this. I just need to figure out how to get back in. Uh, and he's going to look at the staff and say, so you're supposed to lead me back, right? Um. Um, Misha will grab his hand in support. Shock will squeeze it back 
and then check the inside of the sleeve of his robe to see if something has been like stitched in there instruction wise. You know what? I like it because the robes came from J. Kel. And do you think J. Kel wouldn't tell you absolutely everything you needed to know? Inside your sleeve, which I guess you've never checked before, <laughs> is a little pouch that says in some machine language. Beep, beep, beep. Two instructions. The first, how can you tell the age of a hair bit? And the second, how can you tell if a hair bit is two years old? So, and this might, this might need some out of character help because I'm not sure if I as a person remember correctly, but Shock is going to raise up his staff and point it to the left. Exactly. And may that knowledge serve you well. Because as you take your staff and move it to the left, one of the pieces of sheet metal in front of you also slides in the same direction, giving you a door back home. If you closed your eyes and plugged your ears, you could trick yourself into believing you were back with the Speedy Speed Boys. Immediately, the smell of glass and flowers from the valley is overtaken by the smells of a pit stop. Rust, oil, metal, all coming from more machines than even Misha has seen in their whole life. And while these machines don't walk with the same rhythm, some move by treads, others wheels, others still by any number of legs, and that's just for those who travel by ground, they all slowly amble across the wide circular courtyard as if they were following some prescribed routine set by a tick-tocking clock only they can hear. And yeah, you're home. You're in the wheel. Specifically, you're in the main courtyard of the wheel. So it's this large circular space in the center is the main communal area, a pretty big building. There are shops up on the side, quote unquote shops, parts of Power Stand Street that are set up for sharing electricity. And above you, in the circle at the top of the wheel and off on the sea facing side, you can see a bright sunny day. And do we see do we see the apocrita in the sky or Give me a roll. All right then, I will. I will give you a roll. Can I also roll? Can yeah. anybody else? Oh, okay. We would be rolling with intellect to spot, correct? Yep, perception. So, I could spend say two levels of effort and <laughs> with net no cost. Yep. I will spend three levels of effort. Ooh. And I rolled a 14. I rolled a six. I rolled an 11, but I didn't put in any effort because I figured other people would be better at it than I would. Yeah, wait. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Oh, I got a 19. <gasps> and I'm trained in perception. So I think Hallie got a better natural roll, but Tom got a better roll overall. So Tom is going to get an apocryphal to answer. Hallie's going to get something else. Cool. Shock, you look into the sky, you strain your eyes. And you see, eventually, a black spot. But then it disappears, and you see a black spot someplace else. And then that disappears, and you see a black spot somewhere else. And you realize you can't see the cloud. You're just straining your eyes so much that you're starting to see a few spots. Hop, meanwhile, you can't see the Apocrita, but you're also kind of taken in the setting around you. You know, yeah. for everyone, everyone else is a tourist here. Like It's like a new place. Yeah, he's like, well, this is Jacques' home. And you notice a robot that looks only like what I could call the centaur tar from Gravity Falls. <laughs> it's got a body with legs and then a neck and then another body with legs on the other side. Uh, Just I love it. Cork wheeling towards an oblivious Ness who has taken a few steps out into the passageways of the wheel. Oh, oh, Ness, watch, uh, excuse, excuse, excuse me, and he'll grab Ness before he gets just cartwheeled by this stranger. You pull Ness back, ah! and uh, I'm gonna say the machine actually doesn't pay you any mind. They just keep rolling, rolling, rolling. Sorry, excuse us. Watch it! Shock is, because why not use powers we haven't gotten a chance to use, am I right? Am I right, gamers? <laughs> Shock is going to use information gathering. 
I can speak telepathically with any or all machines within one mile or 1.6 kilometers. I can ask one basic question about themselves or anything happening near them and receive a simple answer and cost five intellect points. And so Shock is just going to reach out to as many machines as possible. Um, hi everyone, it's uh, me Shock, you may remember me from the last uh, 18 or so years I, I lived here. Um, has, has anything strange, like a dark cloud looking thing appeared in the sky recently or anything along those lines? And what you just did, Shock, is the equivalent of what would have happened if you ran a bull through a nursing home. You just hear, what? Huh? Who is that? Who is on this channel? Uh, I remember Shaggy is a little big boy. <laughs> oh no. Uh, uh. <laughs> you get the impression pretty quickly that if the machines had bothered to look into the sky and you don't know if they had, they have not seen a black cloud. But before you can sever that connection, you hear one last voice. What did you do? Hello and welcome to the announcement break for Quest Friends episode 74, The Obsidian Cloud, part one. I am Kyle, your GM. Our intro and outro song are Friends and Itoshio, both by Miracle of Sound, and Horace continues to be voiced by the incredible David S. Deer. If you're interested in those theme songs or in David's voice acting, you can find links to all of their stuff in the description. You can also find a link to Emily's short story on Patreon. One of the benefits Patreon backers get if they back at a $5 per month level or above is that each month one of us writes a short story. And as Emily alluded to in the episode, they ended up writing about Ellie's dream that Ellie was having during the opening of this episode. And because the story is just so dang cute, I figured I would make it available for everyone. So again, if you check the links in the description, you will find a link to Emily's short story from February. You should be able to access it no problem, regardless of whether you're a Patreon backer or not. But if you enjoy the short story, you might want to consider backing at a $5 level or above. That's all I've got for you today. Our next episode, The Obsidian Cloud Part 2, will be releasing on Monday, April 19th. But if you'd like additional content before then, you can find stories, artwork, and behind-the-scenes insights at patreon.com slash questfriends. I'll see you there. will attempt to hone in on that mind with the telepathic link. I am so, so glad you're here. We, I, we, we, we need to talk, um, because the whole wheel could be in danger. <sighs> I'll meet you at home. Okay, be right there. And Shock is going to turn to everyone else and say, I don't know, maybe, maybe Lowell was messing with me. It doesn't look like anything's happened here yet, but... I think he's still headed here because he doesn't have any leads on anyone else. So, uh, why don't I show you my home? We, we should go quickly, though, because I probably annoyed a lot of people. They don't usually like it when I shout. When did you shout? 
It was certainly distressing. Well, hold on, hold on. Ness would have heard that. Are you sure? He's really good at blocking people out. Ne- <laughs> Especially Shock. Ness just did not care, ignored it completely. He was distracted. He's like a little kid when their mom is yelling at them and they're playing video games and they just don't hear. Yeah, like, goes in Ness, one ear. Ness, Ness, <laughs> Ness, Ness. Did not, d- did not register with him. Anyways... <laughs> So everyone makes their way from the central plaza of the wheel down the steps to Shock's house. And I want to focus in on part of Shock's house. I want to focus at the top of one of the chimneys where the wind starts to pick up. There isn't any rain or anything, but there is some mist from the beach coming up with all of the crashing waves and the wind. And we see a bird trying to escape the weather fly from off in the distance, far, far away, through the open air, not passing through anything, and then standing on one of the chimneys. And after a few seconds standing on the chimney, the bird is greeted by somebody else. This robotic head in a hood pops up to it and says, Why, hello there, friend. Here to take shelter again. You hear a little tweet, 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 tweet. And this robotic figure extends one of his segmented hands out to the bird, just a little finger, which it jumps on. He says, Well, come on in, because I think we have some visitors. Meanwhile, everybody else, Shock has run down with you. You are on the outside of this very whimsical looking house. It start with the base of a cabin, right? Just a regular log cabin, little house on the prairie. And then add a chimney. And then add another chimney. And then add a third chimney. And they're all zigzagging and it looks almost like a Seuss house with all of these like inventions. And you've got wires for clothes, even though there's no clothes needed. So it's just my good old standby. It's just sheet metal. There's a windmill and multiple inventions out on the outside as well. Little doohickeys and thingamabobs. And one is, yes, just the fork from the Little Mermaid. Aw, adorable. Shock's going to take a deep breath straighten his cloak a little bit and like hold his staff a little bit firmer in one hand and then firmly knock on the door. And after a few seconds where everyone can hear the house just settling and creaking and Shot can hear his own heartbeat getting louder and louder in his ears, the door slowly creeps open. And on the other side, you see a tall robot, probably about Misha's size, He's very heavily resting on one hand on this cane. It looks like a screw with a ball on the top. And then on his other hand, he just has a little bird. And this robot is not like Misha, not an android like Misha that can emote. He has a immovable face. It's just a still face with two glowing eyes. But there's still, I don't know, a warmth to that. Shock. Everything he was planning on saying just leaves his head, and he just moves forward and, and hugs Horace tightly. Oh, whoa, 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 slow down. You don't want to stab yourself on my feathered friend, do you? And he shows off the bird, which has a very long, sharp beak. Shock will step back again and say, Yeah, hi, I'm sorry. I was a little, a little caught up there. It's, it's good to see you again. It's good to see you, (laughs) too. And all of you, I suppose. And the robot turns to face the rest of you. Yes, let me introduce all of my friends. This is Misha Jarvis Badge, Hopper Scotch, Ellie Badge, Ness, and Cubo. It is a pleasure to meet you. My name is the incalculable quorum of beneficial outputs, but you can call me Cubo. Please state your name and your relationship to shock so that I may update my relationship matrix. Oh! And the machine kind of gets on. He, he leans on one of his knees and looks down to Kubo. Jekyll will like you. <laughs> and then, without answering Kubo's question, he walks inside, just saying, Come, come. The wind and the sea have been acting up, and they make a dreadful combination. Best to get into shelter before the weather gets worse. Ellie has raised one eyebrow, but doesn't say anything. Shock will also gesture for everyone to come in and say, Everyone, this is Horace. 
He took care of me when I was young. He found me when I was very little and brought me to the wheel. Her other eyebrow goes up. <laughs> Horace, marked as guardian in my relationship matrix. And yeah, Shock will step inside. Yeah. So I'm not going to do this house justice the way Tom described it in Shock's memory, but what you find yourself in... I've just realized there aren't enough chairs in this house, are there? <laughs> no, there aren't, and that's about to be addressed. Don't you worry. So you walk inside the house, and it is very reminiscent of the outside of the house. It's this small and dingy, but also very homey space, straight from a fairy tale. It's warm, light colors, soft hues, and light browns. There is this little traveler's shelf when you come in that's full of, like, supplies to leave and has a cute little probably home sweet home style message there. There are a few wooden doors, some leading to resting areas, some leading to who knows where. But notably by Horace, there is a table with, I'll say, three chairs, and then maybe a little impromptu stool that Horace is picking up and setting down. Now, I had a feeling you would be returning soon, but I'm afraid I underestimated how many gifts you'd bring home with you. Oh, well, I did actually have, like, like a proper gift, like you always used to bring me. And Shock is actually going to slip out one of the recorder headbands. It's kind of spotty coverage, and a lot of it was just staking out or spying on adventures we were on, but there are a lot of, a lot of memories from my travels recorded uh, on this band. And it's linked up with this one here, too, so that you can see through one to the other. Horace takes it and immediately starts tinkering with it, and he presses a button that pulls up something from a few hours ago, where we can just see in the distance this purple frog leapfrogging over a bunch of things, a bunch of, like, tubes, before trying to attach itself and pendle them across something and getting cut off by a death laser. And he just laughs to himself and goes... <laughs> And what adventures they are. I'm almost afraid to ask what else you've gotten up to in the previous year. Nessa's looking at the video going, when the fuck was this? Because he misses everything, apparently. <laughs> Wait, wasn't wasn't that the race between Jimmy and, and Misha? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't Ness see that? Oh, that's the car. Yes, he did see that. The tire fly. Next day, I was imagining an actual frog and I was like, this is weird. <laughs> When did we do that? <laughs> but it was Misha's car all along, was the frog. Maybe the real frog was the friends we made along the way. Look, it has been it has been a long time since we have recorded. Maybe for you. For me. I'll, only I matter. <laughs> Misha will straighten up a little bit at seeing one of Shock's tattoos and just just be a little bit uncomfortable. Not uncomfortable, but just a little bit nervous. Ellie will pop out her folding chair <laughs> and, like, sit down on it and lean back a little bit casually and cross her arms and just look. Incredible. Ness has taken the stool. He's sitting on a little stool, moving his little legs back and forth. Hopper is still standing. He's not going to take a chair if anybody else wants one. Shock is also part excitement, part anxiety, hovering and not sitting down. Misha is not sitting down either. <laughs> Ellie solved a problem, which did not. No one had asked. Horace is also not sitting down. He's standing. He's leaning more on his cane. And there's just a pause. Ellie stands back Have up. <laughs> <laughs> well... Now it's kind of weird because I thought we were all sitting down and I was like, oh, I have another chair, but nobody else is sitting down. And now I feel really weird. So I'm just going to stand back up and put my chair back on my back and we can pretend that I didn't do that. Have humans stopped sitting in the past year? Oh, oh, no, no. We are. I think we're we're all just a little bit worked up. We came here believing the wheel was in very immediate danger. I think everyone's just a little a little worked up still from all of that. And Shock will actually sit down at that, sort of like scolded by dad. <laughs> Ellie will sigh and take her chair back <laughs> off her back and slowly creak it open. 
and set it down and push it so that it's flat and sit back down slowly and look at everyone. Misha will nod and say, oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I shall sit down as well. Already an uncomfortable in-law moment. <laughs> the worst. <laughs> And Horace is just staring at all of you. Shock, you can recognize that Horace is just curious. He's excited. Like, he always would talk about all of the amazing things that he would see, all of the adventures he was excited for you to go on. And he's just so excited to see what yours have brought. But to everyone else, you just see an emotionless robot staring at all of you, like looking at one and then turning (laughs) and then turning back. You know, Misha was driving that car. They're an amazing (laughs) driver. You drove that frog? Uh, It is a frog, right? Yes, it, it, it is a, a, a purple frog. I, I designed that car and I drove it. I like driving cars and I was in a race. And yes, I, I did it. I'm glad you liked it, sir. Please, sir was my father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no need to be so formal. Please, all of you call me Horace. Noted. I shall call you Horace then. I had heard about you from Shock a lot. He has told me a lot about you, told us a lot about you, and I'm glad to meet you, finally. I'm glad to meet all of you, too. I hoped Shock would bring something or or someone back. I, I couldn't have imagined it'd be anything... anything like this. Shock, not wanting to, like, get too much into business until Jekyll arrives, but also wanting to help bridge this gap for his family, will start telling Horace how he met the party. It'll be sort of an abridged version of their adventures, but he'll try to go through the story of how he met everyone in Rhubarb and what's been happening to them since. Okay. To give give Horace an idea of who everyone is, what they've all been doing together, and also to prevent it from turning into an awkward <laughs> silence. <laughs> yeah, so I imagine it's silence and then just... So anyways, I met all of these people on a mission when I was doing this and doing that, and just like speeding through. It's, it's not quite like that nervous awkward, but also Shock is probably not telling the story as well as he could be. Just like, oh, I forgot. I really... I forgot to mention, before all of that happened... We actually met this strange, uh, this strange AI here, and uh, also I fell down this pit. <laughs> and when you're done telling your story, Horace will just stand there. He is still leaning on his cane, but he's leaning with both arms. The bird is now on his shoulder, just enraptured in your story. And he takes his segmented hand and strokes his non-existent beard. Hmm. The Nano Spirits did say you had another friend who was trying to kill you. This is all very, very interesting. What do you think, Jekyll? And he turns over, and you can see it just at the doorway this tiny robotic bookworm about four feet tall if you put him on his end, with a soldered cravat on his chest. And where you would see sweat from a human, you can just see bolts (laughs) coming off of this robot as he just shakes. And Jake Hell goes, What do I think? What do I think? I think this is an unmitigated disaster! I think that all of the lessons must have been for naught, since I think we may need to update our curriculum about the dangers of the outside. Okay. Uh, sorry. I, I, I want to make it clear that it's like a cloud. What? Oh, oh. <laughs> Jekyll's just freaking out about the Apocrita. Gotcha. Yeah. I thought it was about the friends. I thought it was about us and I was very offended. Right. I also thought I was like, whoa, buddy. <laughs> 
Like, Misha wasn't already backing out towards the door, like looking for the handle. Like I am gonna leave this. Uh, well, you he he doesn't specify, so you may think of it that way. <laughs> like we're just gonna go. Shock though will stand up while this is happening, and then slowly move over to Jaquel and also give him a warm hug, <laughs> but release him quickly just in case he wasn't comfortable with it. Yeah, actually, he leans into the hug for a second, despite himself, because J. Kell is excited to have you back. But then he remembers, you know, everything else, and he quickly takes his little bug arms, pushes them against you, and then turns to face Horus. A cloud! A cloud! A dangerous cloud! Did you hear that, Horus? A cloud! Mm, I heard, J. Kell. The wheel isn't equipped to handle clouds, Horus. We're equipped to handle not many things, but definitely not clouds. <laughs> Anyways. And as you set him down, he scuttles up onto the table and starts pacing back and forth with his many legs. And I'm going to say his he's partially up, so he's just doing the think, think, think that Winnie the Pooh does to himself with some of his legs. The rest are scuttling back and forth. So now that you know what's happening, is the shield strong enough to keep the Apocrita out? I know I've been gone for a while, but everything feels rustier than I remembered. I didn't see it active before. Well, that's because it hasn't been active for a few months. Oh, has anyone tried to fix it yet? Do you not remember the vote before you left? No, no one has tried to fix it, Shock. No one has fixed much of anything around here. That's why I need to give my vocal friend here... And the bird chirps. And my other vocal friend here... And J. Kel continues to mutter... (laughs) Shelter whenever the weather starts to act up. Well, well, perhaps the, uh... Perhaps those spirits know something. Those nano-spirits. They always had strange and... Reckless ideas. They had terrible ideas that were wrong. Well, yes, but we're 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 kind of low on ideas right now. Well, we're not exactly speaking to them much anymore. But with me, they abandoned you. Of course, they abandoned you. I knew they were always unreliable. When this cloud business is done, I'll go step into that data thing myself and mm, and he starts to sweat out more bolts as he just like steams with rain Ellie and sud- continues pacing faster. Ellie suddenly feels like this just huge wave of kinship. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a little more complicated than all of that, but we do have Misha Jarvis here, so we can access the data sphere quite easily still. Oh, are you one of those wizards as well? Oh, Yes, I suppose you could call me that. It is a little different than than shock, but um, I am very experienced at accessing the data sphere, so I can look things up. Horus. Fascinating. I would love to hear more about Horus. Exactly the ways in which you Horus can manifest this. Horus, we don't really. Now is not the time to ask these kinds of questions. Oh, <laughs> right. Yes, sorry. I... uh, Forgive me for forgetting about the Armageddon cloud. So what is your plan, Shock? Well, I mean, we should first start by fixing the shield, because the wheel just needs that in general, and maybe we can make it stronger than it was before. After that, I'm not really sure, because we had... We have the tools we need to stop the cloud, sort of. I guess we'll probably need to get the ladybug from outside, too, because I don't know how we'd get up there to it, but... You brought the walking car with you? Uh, excuse me, walking what? Oh, yes, we have a nice vehicle. It was built by some dear friends. It's just outside the entrance right now. I helped Chuck bring it. That's true. Yeah, that's right. I guess we never did do proper introductions, which I guess. <laughs> that's fine. So, who was the last person responsible for maintenance of the shield here? That would be... Hmm. Jake Hell, you know more of the machines around here. Who would be in charge of that? Yes, Horse, just because I actually talk to the other machines once in a while, suddenly I'm the expert. It was Unit 909, but they haven't been in charge of that for a year or so. But... but why is that? (sighs) 
I suppose it is time. You've shared your secrets. It's only fair we share ours as well. What secrets do we have? You... Horace, don't tell me you didn't say anything to him. And Horace is going to motion for you to take a seat, Shock, as he finally takes one of his own. Yeah, he'll sit back down. Shock, when you left, I said that the wheel had voted on two items. One, for you to take my place as the town's scavenger. And the other, for you to use it as an enrichment experience. A way to interact with more life forms than the wheel could provide. That isn't exactly the case. There were two votes, and one was to let you leave the wheel, yes. But the other vote, that decision, was to discontinue the scavenging program. You were never supposed to bring anything back to the wheel, Shock. You were supposed to leave permanently. Kicking you out? That's so rude. They mowgli and you? Boo. Uh, one last reminder. With God as my witness in front of all of you, so you don't forget, and more importantly, I don't forget, Kubo is in fact still with you. <laughs> he may not, he may have done literally nothing for like months of episodes now, but he is technically still with you. Don't worry, we won't forget Kubo. You're still here? Ness says every time he sees Kubo. All right, so you're outside. You can hear the ambience of the bog. Typical, moo, the, the ambience. I'm not going to be flow. Was that a moo? What the <laughs> fuck? <Moo. laughs> are, they ghost, are they ghost cows? Swamp ghost cows? You can see a cow just getting quickly fossilized. Just moo. Well, now it's really dark. I don't like that. Don't fossilize a cow. Okay, never mind. <laughs> you can see a bog cow. It's one of the few cows that is not affected by the fossilization of the bog. It's just like a fucking shark, just... Like a manatee? But for bugs? I was thinking like a shark that like comes out of the water and goes back in. Yeah, manatee, that's better. A manatee What about a whale that looks like a cow? We don't need to do that because we already decided it was a manatee. Like, it has has spots on it, which are called sea cows, so it makes sense. (laughs) Unfortunately, Ari's description now lives rent-free in my brain. The spotted whale with horns. Moo! (laughs) They're man-a-beef. Oh, just getting magic school bus vibes. <laughs> no way! <laughs> no way! <laughs> Hop would be so much better than Carlo. Who is Arnold? Arnold. Arnold. Carlos. Carlos is the guy who makes bad <laughs> jokes, and then everyone's like, Carlos. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah, the one, Ar- Arnold, he's the one who takes off his helmet on Pluto. He did for sure! Yeah! Yo. And he gets a, he gets a cold... I was scared of that seat as a kid. It was a nightmare. It's fucking horrifying. He was dead for sure. Secret, Ness invents Nestle chocolate. No, Nestle does. (laughs) (laughs) That dweeb, he doesn't like anything cool. Nonverbal communication. Yeah, to kind of tell you like, hey, come to the sound. It's nice and juicy. I'm gonna cut what? that and just go where you go nonverbal communication. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't, please, please, it's nice and juicy. <laughs> I just imagine, like, if there's like a camera of Hop being the last one entering, he would just like straight up look into the camera as he slowly <laughs> slides through the rock. God, Misha definitely did hear just a cacophony of angry old folks. Yeah, Misha was very distressed. Somehow more hectic than the data sphere, which is literal, like millions of pieces of information flying at milli- like light speed. But like the data sphere isn't as grumpy as, as the wheel of Oz. <laughs> like everyone's just sitting down like, ah, yes, just another quiet, peaceful afternoon. Meanwhile, shot from a ledge with a bullhorn. Hi, everyone. 
Are you saying anything suspicious lately? God damn it. (laughs) If everyone listening followed Hallie right now, she still wouldn't have as many followers as Ari. Yeah. (laughs) Wait, we don't know that math. I haven't done the math. I haven't broken it down. I could get out Excel right now and I could do that. I have done the math. It wouldn't be enough. Okay, but what if you're wrong? What if I... Not unless we get a big surge of popularity for the finale. Anyways, are we are we are we ready to play the game? <laughs> I, I I guess. Yeah, we're done bullying Hallie for you now. You can censor me all you like, <laughs> but I will come back stronger than ever. Go to my Twitter <laughs> and tell me about why I'm right. Oh uh, well, I I'll, I will just say that Misha will kind of straighten up at seeing the two daddy dad. <laughs> just be, seeing the daddies. <laughs> The daddies. The daddies. Oh, there's only one daddy right now. The other daddy is coming. Daddy too. Oh, I forgot. I I thought the other one also was there. I was gonna say daddos first of all, but daddies. Uh, no, the other. The, the if the other daddy was here, trust me, you would hear that daddy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyways. <laughs> Gang, good news. We've got a lot of post-credits material. Bad news, not a lot of main content material (laughs) because I got distracted by the magic school bus. That's fine. That's fine. God, (laughs) we're the worst.